Hi, my name is Steve Mann and welcome to the fibre unit of my Introduction to Papermaking course. In this unit we're going to be answering the questions where do fibres come from, what do they look like, how do they differ and how do we get from a tree to an individual fibre. Well this little uh, tree explains exactly where fibres may come from. Fibres we can divide into either natural or man-made fibres. Man-made fibres could be organic, metallic or ceramic and natural fibres could be animal, mineral or vegetable. And 95% of all fibres used in paper making are vegetable fibres. So they're the ones we're going to concentrate on. Where do fibres come from? Well, you can see the uh, natural growth of a plant, but you know, life isn't so simple. Let's look at that in a little more detail. Vegetable fibres, anything that grows. So we could categorise them as either wood or non-wood. Non-wood fibres are really the annual crops. Abaca, which is a version of hemp, the gas which comes from sugarcane, Bamboo is a, a fibre of growing use these days. Wood fibres could be divided into either hardwoods or softwoods. Softwood trees were around millions of years before the hardwood trees. So hardwoods are a much more complex structure. Softwood trees produce long, wide fibres that are great for strength. Hardwood trees produce shorter fibres that are stiffer and are great for appearance. So it's one thing that the paper maker always has to balance. Does he want strength? Does he want appearance? Where is the, where is the, uh, the line? Okay, going back to our plant growth. How does a plant grow? How does it produce fibres? Well, we may remember from school the old uh, biology lessons on photosynthesis, but essentially a plant starts to grow and what happens? It sucks in water through its roots, it breathes in carbon dioxide through its leaves and it expels oxygen. While it's doing that it's actually producing glucose, lots and lots of glucose. And glucose is an essential building block of all plant materials. Why is it essential building block? Because what the plant does is it joins all the glucose molecules together and it produces cellulose. And it's cellulose that we paper makers use to make our paper. In fact, the plant is rather like a, a little bioassembly line. As you see here, one part of the plant is taking in raw materials, carbon dioxide and water. It's producing glucose molecules, but then Another part of the plant is like an assembly line. It's assembling these glucose molecules. If it assembles them one way, it produces starch. And that's the energy reserve of the plant. It's reserved, it's stored in the leaves, and of course, sometimes in bulbous tubers like the potato. Another way it can assemble glucose molecules is to produce cellulose, and that's the stuff that we paper makers really need. So how does it do it? Well, it starts off by producing these long cellulose filaments. It's a single molecule thick, so it's not very strong. But these long cellulose filaments are then entwined around each other, like you see here, opened up, and here more like reality. And these we call microfibrils. Now, the microfibrils then wrap around themselves and they form fibrils. And the fibrils come together side by side to form a lamella or a layer. Now, when I describe this to my students, I use the analogy of a rope. So here's the rope. If you look here, we have these very tiny filaments, just like the cellulose chain. These tiny filaments wrap around each other to form these 
the microfibril. The microfibrils wrap around each other to form the fibril and if we put these side by side we then get the lamella, the layer that curls around and forms the walls of the fibre. So we'll dispense with that little aid for the moment. And here we see a typical fibre. A typical fibre has four walls. A primary wall, where the fibrils are randomly oriented. The secondary wall is divided into three levels, the S1, the S2 and the S3. The S1 and S3 are very similar, having between four and six layers of fibrils, all organised in a crisscross fashion. So layer one will corkscrew around that way, Layer 2 will go that way, layer 3 will go that way, and so on. The S2 wall has the nickname of the papermaker's layer. And the S2 wall is some 30 to 150 layers thick. Now before we move on, I also uh, have a nice little model to demonstrate this. And I'd like to introduce my uh, young assistant. This is this is this is my son Kevin. Hello. And um, thank you, Kevin. You, you can go sit down now. This is Kevin's lightsaber, <laughs> and this is a perfect example of a fibre. So here we see the hole down the centre of the fibre, the lumen, and we see the four walls: the S3, the S2, the S1. And the primary wall. Okay, thank you Kevin, just sit down now. Good boy. So, back to the lesson. So the plant produces these fibres, the fibres grow up into trees and as I mentioned earlier the main the trees that are used are the hardwood trees Hardwood trees have short, stiff fibres, very good for appearance. And softwood trees have long, wide fibres, very good for strength. <clears throat> Just to give you some idea of the variety of shapes and sizes of fibres, here's a table. I'll just point out a couple of them. Coniferous plants, or the evergreens, or the softwoods, typically three to four millimetres in length, 40 microns wide. Deciduous fibres, hardwoods, typically half the length of a softwood. Cotton linters could be up to eight millimetres long. The abaca fibres used for making things like tea bag and coffee filter, up to 12 millimetres long or even more. And if we look at the constituents of these materials, Hardwood, about 45% cellulose, 34% hemicellulose, that's something that you'll study in depth in other courses, and 21% lignin. Lignin is the thing that holds all the fibres together in the tree. It's almost like a, a hot melt adhesive. Softwoods, similar amount of cellulose, 43%, less hemicellulose, but more lignin on average. <clears throat> now then, how do we get from the tree to the individual fibre? We do that by a process called pulping. And generally speaking, there are three versions of pulping. There's chemical pulping methods, which are the most modern. This involves chopping down the tree into little chips, stewing them up in chemicals under high temperatures and pressures for a, a, a length of time. The very first material that was ever uh, method that was done was mechanical pulping. And the original mechanical pulping involved taking the log and pressing it up against a great big grindstone to produce what's called uh, a groundwood pulp. Later, we developed um, machinery that was more controllable, the refiner, and we chopped down the 
uh, trees down into wood chips. It's similar size as we use for chemical pulps. And then of course the, there's been a new development, hybrid pulping, which combines some mechanical action and some chemical action. Now this is a all-encompassing uh, schematic for how you get from the forest to the products that we use today. So we take the tree in the forest and we chop it down, we get rid of the branches and the bark and we bring it into the mill. We saw it down to about one meter lengths called bolts. We store them for a while. We uh, put them through a debarking facility, get rid of all the bark, that's no use to paper makers. And from there, we can store these debarked logs and then we can put them onto the grindstone process and produce groundwood pulps. Or we can take this debarked material and we can chip them. You need to pass it through a, a screen. Small chips are rejected and go to waste. Oversized chips go back around the system. And then the right size chip goes onto chip storage. If we stick with mechanical methods, we can now put it through our refiner or if we want to choose a chemical method then we can stew it up with chemicals as I said high temperature and pressures in a device that we call a digester. A little more detail about mechanical pulps. We've got the refined mechanical pulps which are the new materials. We have the old-fashioned mechanical pulps what we call the, uh, the groundwood pulps where we use a great big grindstone. One of the most common methods of mechanical pulping is known as TMP, thermal mechanical pulp. So we'll just look at that in a little more detail. Here's a schematic. We bring the chips in, we pass them through screens to make sure they're the right size. We might give a bit of a wash, preheat them, take off some excess steam, put them through a refiner. The refiner will generate lots of friction that will cause heat that will cause the water to turn into steam so we need to vent it before the equipment explodes and then we'll pass it through a second refiner more friction, more heat, more steam generated let off this and then we pass it into a tank known as a latency tank final bit of screening to remove all the chips that have not been uh, reduced to individual fibres and then we'll dewater them, store them ready for use later in the process. The hybrid methods are semi-chemical semi -chemical pulps. Here's three examples. CTMP is very common pulp. Chemi, thermal mechanical pulp. CMP, chemi mechanical pulp. And NSSC, neutral sulfite semi-chemical. This was mainly used for fluting, the wiggly bit inside cardboard. Uh, but that's now generally been replaced by recycled fibre. Now we move on to chemical pulps. Chemical pulps, the original pulping method was the soda process. That was then replaced by the sulphite process, Swedish chemist, and that was then replaced by the sulphate process. The sulfate process is also known as the craft process, and this is the most widely used process these days. This analysis shows you the production volumes for different types of chemical pulp. By far the largest is bleached craft. Next is unbleached craft, and as you can see, sulfite pulping, very small these days. Bleached sulfites on bleach sulfites. If we compare sulfate pulp to sulfite pulp we see the differences. The sulfate pulp is a less aggressively treated pulp. The sulfite process is very very aggressive. The sulfite process destroys that primary layer. The sulfate process keeps it intact. Consequence of that we see in refining. Where we have the sulfate pulp, we need a lot more refining because we need to break down that primary wall before we can start to wet out the fibre. With the sulfite pulp, that primary wall's gone, 
so we can just start refining, start wetting straight away. The sulphite pulp, be more aggressive, removes most of the lignin, therefore we need less bleaching. The sulphate pulp removes less lignin, so we need more bleaching. If it removes less lignin, then the pulp is a darker colour. If we remove more lignin, the pulp's brighter. So, six stages of bleaching, only three stages of bleaching. And here's a typical chemical pulping process. We take the material, be the hardwoods or softwoods, impregnate them, in other words, add the special chemicals, the cooking liquor, put them into the digester, high temperatures, high pressures, for a given length of time, dissolving away mainly the lignin. Then we remove the dissolved lignin, we wash the fibres, we put them through screens so that we get the individual fibres that we do want and any uh, fibre bundles that have not been separated or cooked properly can go back around the system again. And then we'll bleach them three to six stages depending on whether it was a sulphate cook or a sulphite cook. And then we've got the pulp that's ready for sale. Final thing to mention is recycled fibre. Recycled fibre is good. I uh, mentioned in a, an other unit that there are economic and social benefits of recycling fibre. Social benefits mean less landfill and landfills becoming, uh, or space for landfill is becoming an increasingly rare resource these days. And of course, if we're using reusing re, uh, recycling fiber then we don't have to buy virgin fiber from abroad and therefore it reduces the balance of payments of the country and as well as just recycling the fiber there are other useful chemicals like the fillers clays and calcium carbonates that we can recover and reuse there are five major groupings for recycled fiber and each one of those groupings has seven to twelve subgroups so altogether there are well over 50 different groups of re or 50 different grades of re recycled fiber that the buyer can purchase so that's the end of the fibers module i hope you found it interesting and i hope you return for another module thank you hope you enjoyed it